I'm going to talk this morning um, only for about 20, 25 minutes um, to then throw it back to you for questions um, on the subject of trickle treatment, which is a, a book about alternative medicine. Um, but if you've read any of my other books, you'll know this is quite a departure from what I've, I've written about in the past. I've written about mathematics and I've written about cryptography and, and uh, information security because um, I'm a science journalist and I write about anything and everything that interests me or, or, or fascinates me. In fact, the last book I wrote um, was, if I can get my PowerPoint up and running, just to put me into context, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about this very briefly um, and how, how as a writer you become so obsessed about your topic. Many of the academics here take one subject and devote their entire lives to it. I take a subject for three or four years and focus on it. But still the obsession is, is very real. And... Um, my, my obsession on this subject, I think, was best typified when I'd just finished writing the book and I was sat at home one day and I was obsessed about the universe and how the universe was created and when it was created and how it evolved. And I'll be talking a bit about that later this afternoon. Um, but I became so obsessed that there was a song on the radio and it caught my attention. It was a song by somebody called Katie Mellower. Uh, and the song was called uh, Nine Million Bicycles. Um, and the song goes, there are nine million bicycles in Beijing, that's a fact, just like the fact that I love you, la di da di da It's a very nice song. The second verse, however, goes like this. We are 12 billion light years from the edge. That's a guess. No one can ever say it's true. But I know that I will always be with you. Now, I'm sure you can see the problem with that just as clearly as I can. Um, we're not 12 billion light years from the edge. If, if that's an implication for the age of the universe, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Um, it's not a guess. In science, we don't make guesses. Um, no one can ever say it's true. That, that's, that, that's, that's fair enough, but in science, we can get closer to the truth. That's the important thing. Um, but I know that I will always be with you. Well, at this point, I can't trust a word this woman says. So... Um, <laughs> So I wrote an article for The Guardian, and um, I, I, I explained why this song annoyed me. And it was only a piece of fun. I was just trying to say, it's amazing that we're tiny animals on a tiny planet with tiny brains, and yet we can look up into the universe, and we can begin to unravel it. So it was just a piece of fun with a semi-serious point. And at the end of the article, I rewrote the lyrics. So my version of the lyrics went... We are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error bars. And with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. Um, um, but amazingly, the same day this article was published, actually the following day that the article was published, um, I got a phone call, and it was Katie Mellower. Um, <laughs> And it turned out that when she was a young girl, she was a member of the astronomy club at school, and she liked science, and she liked astronomy, and she kind of liked the fun of this. And she re-recorded her song. We met up at the BBC, and she re-recorded her song using my lyrics. <laughs> so um, I'll just play you this very, very briefly. High point of my career. Um, Katie, Kelly, Katie Mello is singing her song, but with my lyrics. We are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error bars. And with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. So, how did I get from there to, to writing about alternative medicine? Well, um, it started off with acupuncture. I, I was watching a TV program just uh, back oh, God, three or four years ago now. I was sat at home watching a program. And I, I was watching it because um, it was called Alternative Medicine, The Evidence. And alternative medicine is one of those things that's become increasingly popular. And I was curious, what is the evidence? And here was a program. It was the BBC... Um, and it was BBC Two, the kind of most um, academic channel, perhaps. Uh, it was made by the Open University, again, very respected institution, and it was presented by Professor Cathy Sykes, who's a professor of science communication and, and someone who I've worked with in the past and generally sort of very well regarded. And the first program was all about acupuncture. Uh, and the idea of acupuncture was, is that 
thousands of years old in China, people believe that qi flows through our body in channels called meridians. If there's a blockage in the qi, a blockage in the meridian, that leads to ill health. Acupuncture means you put in very fine needles, you can balance the flow of qi, and you can restore health. It became popular in, in, in the West when Nixon went to China, and a journalist called James Reston uh, suffered a severe appendicitis, I think, had, had an operation in China, had stomach pains afterwards, and then was surprised one, when somebody came into his room and started putting needles in his leg, which immediately reduced the pain in his stomach. And he went back to America, wrote about this amazing thing called acupuncture, and the boom in acupuncture started from the, from the early 70s. Now, the, this program was about acupuncture, and I thought, well, you know, it, does all of this ring true? Is it real? Is it, um, uh, you know, what is the evidence? This was the subtitle of the program, so I thought, well, I can rely on this program. And the opening scene of that program, uh, let me explain it to you. It showed a woman in... In, in a hospital in Shanghai, having a young woman, probably in her 20s, having major heart surgery. And she was still conscious because instead of general anesthetic, she was having acupuncture. This was the opening bit of the program. You switched on, the first thing you saw was this woman having this major heart surgery, acupuncture instead of general anesthetic. And uh, Kathy Sykes said, you know, what can this miraculous treatment tell us in the 21st century? Uh, did, I, did anybody see it? I think it was broadcast here in Australia as well. Maybe it wasn't. Okay. Oh, I see a few hands going up. Okay. So, and I was shocked and stunned. Could it really be true that here was a woman having acupuncture instead of general anesthetic for major heart surgery? And... Um, because I'm a journalist, I did a bit of digging. I thought either this is the most miraculous piece of TV I'm going to see all year, or there's something suspicious going on. So I started ringing around a few people. I started ringing up heart specialists, ringing up anaesthetists. I rang up the Royal College of Anaesthetists, and they actually done a report for this very program. They'd written a report for the BBC based on the footage that they'd seen, and they sent me their report. And sure enough, this woman had acupuncture instead of general anaesthetic. But, in addition to the acupuncture, she had three of the most powerful sedatives known to mankind, more powerful than morphine, and large volumes of local anaesthetic. Um, in other words, the acupuncture was purely cosmetic. It wouldn't have mattered if the acupuncture was there or not. She was so pumped full of drugs, she wasn't going to feel any pain. And I, I rang up a few other people and I said, look, you know, what, what impression did you get from this program? And everybody I spoke to, including TV reviewers who'd written about it in glowing terms, said, well, we assumed it was just simply no general anaesthetic and acupuncture instead. And when I told them about all the other things that were going on, they were quite shocked. So I submitted a complaint to the BBC, and eventually, after about a year, the complaint was upheld. But this got me thinking. If I hadn't done some digging, I would have been left with the impression, as probably a million other people were who watched this program, that acupuncture could indeed do miraculous things. And if I had a pain or if I suffered from any condition, I probably would have run down to my local acupuncturist the next day to see what they could do to help me. So I thought this program was... was uh, I love the BBC. I think it does amazing things. But I thought this particular program was disastrous because it, was, it, was, it gave such a misleading impression to the public. And I thought... And once you do a bit more digging, once you look around on the internet and you read more magazines and you uh, um, begin to investigate a bit more, you realize there's huge amounts of wild and exaggerated claims made for alternative medicine. So I thought, why not write a book on the subject? Why not look at the evidence uh, and present people with, with, the, with, with the real evidence about alternative medicine? Um, a lot of people have accused me of being anti-alternative medicine because a lot of the conclusions I've come to are quite negative. But they're not all negative. In some cases, they're, they're, they're positive about some particular alternative therapies. And so the idea of the book was to look at each individual alternative therapy, look at the evidence, where the evidence was positive, say so, where the evidence was negative, say so, uh, where the evidence was non-existent, again, be open about that. If something was biologically implausible, say that. If there was risks of harm, point that out. If it seemed relatively safe, point that out as well. So I think what we've done in the book is be very open and honest 
about alternative medicine and the evidence for and against it, the evidence for effectiveness and risks. That's my co-author, Professor Edzard Ernst. Um, I co-authored the book with Edzard because I, I sort of bumped into him when I was looking into acupuncture and the BBC investigation. And if you get interested in, in alternative medicine, you can't really avoid Edzard. Very quickly, you bump into him because he was the world's first professor of complementary medicine. Uh, about 16 or 17 years ago, he took up a post at Pen Peninsula Medical School or Exeter University. And he has a background in alternative medicine. He, he uh, practiced homeopathy at a, a German hospital for a while. His family brought him up on herbal remedies. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he, he used manual therapies when he was a professor in uh, Vienna. But while having an interest, an ongoing interest in alternative therapies, he also had a very strong career in mainstream medicine, especially in research. So 15 years ago, when he moved to Britain, his goal was to take his knowledge as a researcher, as a rigorous researcher, and apply that to alternative therapies. Uh, and to do some research of his own, but more importantly, to look at all the other research that's already been done. Because again, people will say, oh, the problem is that not enough research has been done on alternative medicine. In fact, there's been a huge amount of research done. And the problem is pulling it all together and making sense of it all. And that's what Edzard's been doing. So the idea of the book was to look at his research, to look at his overview of other people's research, to look at other people's overviews, and to bring it all together in, 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 in one book that mums, dads, anybody who cares about their own health or their children's health could, could look at. Um, let me see if I can... The first thing we did in the book, um, and, I, and the first thing I want to point out to you now, is how do we work out whether a treatment is effective or not? And this is the same for a conventional medicine as it would be for an alternative medicine. Um, there are various subtle variations on this, but, but the key breakthrough is the invention of the clinical trial. For thousands of years, doctors practiced medicine um, plucking ideas out of thin air, uh, or they would pluck ideas given to them by the Greeks, or, or they would come up with ideas based on their own personal experience. But it was a pretty shoddy way to do medicine. Um, so the idea of bloodletting, for example, bloodletting was practiced all over the world because the idea was that if you were ill, there was a poison that had accumulated in your blood somewhere. If you bled the patient, you released the poison, you could make them well. And in fact, all that was happening, instead of, uh, of bleeding out the poison, the life force from people was being bled out of them. And bleeding was doing a lot more harm than good. But doctors were, were convinced it was effective because the Greeks told them, because their professors told them because they would remember those patients who survived and forget those who died. Um, if a patient was feverishly ill and they, were, they had some bloodletting, um, the immediate effect was to sedate the patient. And that gave the impression that the doctor was doing good, but in fact they were only doing harm. So it's only with the invention of the clinical trial that we can begin to show that something like bloodletting is dangerous and ineffective as opposed to being relatively safe and effective. And the first clinical trial, there's some debate about this, but one of the first clinical trials concerned the condition of scurvy. In uh, the 18th century and before that, scurvy was killing thousands of sailors around the world. As sailors went further and further afield, uh, they began to succumb to this condition whereby their gums and their, and, and their joints would literally disintegrate and their bodies would fall apart. It was a horrendous way to die, and thousands of sailors were dying. Far more were dying of scurvy than of, say, shipwrecks or, or battles and so on. And, but nobody could work out how to treat scurvy until this guy came along, James Lind, a Scottish naval surgeon. And Lind came up with the idea of a clinical trial. He uh, it was only in the English Channel. He wasn't far, far out to sea, but the ship was in the English Channel, and it had been, it had been away from the coast for a long time. So the sailors started succumbing to scurvy. And he took six pairs of sailors and he put them in the same part of the ship so they had the same environment. He gave them the same diet. Um, they all had the same level of scurvy. But they were all treated differently. So you could control for different things like conditions and diet and so on and compare and contrast between different therapies. So he gave one pair of sailors uh, vinegar. One pair of sailors got seawater. Uh, another pair of sailors got cider. Another pair of sailors got um, sulfuric acid. Um, but one pair of sailors got lemon juice. And within a few days, while everybody else was pretty sick still, 
and getting worse, the lemon juice pair were making a remarkable recovery. And that was just absolutely concrete evidence that lemon juice was the cure for scurvy. Lind had no idea about vitamin C, he had no idea what was going on, but he knew that lemon juice cured scurvy. Um, so actually, the sailors who took cider also showed some levels of recovery because apples, I think, have vitamin C in them as well, but the manufacturing of cider destroys most of the vitamin C. But some residual vitamin C seemed to have helped, to some extent, another pair of the, the sailors. Um, so that's how you tell if something works. You give one group of patients a certain therapy, and you give another group of patients either nothing, or a rival therapy, or most likely of all, a placebo therapy. Because if we just give this group of patients a therapy and that group of patients nothing at all, this group will benefit from the so-called placebo effect. You're being cared about. You're, you're waiting for a remedy. When you get that remedy, you have an expectation. That gives you perhaps a psychological boost. It allows you to perhaps tolerate your symptoms. Uh, you, you maybe want to um, you know, give positive feedback to the people involved in the research. So there are all sorts of what are called non-specific factors, including the placebo effect, which means that even if I give you a sugar pill and I give you nothing, you will respond better than this group over here. So to account for those non-specific and placebo effects, I'm going to give you the real treatment, but I'm going to give you something that looks like the real treatment, but which isn't. And nobody will know which group they're in. Then if, if both groups perform... Uh, 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 have similar benefits, we know that you're just responding to the non-specific effects, which can be important. But if this group does better than that group, then we know there's something more going on and that the treatment you're receiving uh, actually is genuinely beneficial beyond these non-specific effects. And that's how we work out which therapies work and which ones don't. So very briefly, I thought I'd look at one uh, condition in particular, one therapy in particular, one alternative therapy, and just look at the, de the evidence for that. And I was going to look at homeopathy, uh, just because it's one of the most popular therapies, and um, it's been one of the most tested therapies. So first of all, what is homeopathy? I'm going to go through this very, very quickly, just to leave plenty of time for questions. Homeopathy was invented 200 years ago by a German chap called Samuel Hahnemann. Hahnemann could see that conventional medicine at that time was useless. Bloodletting was going on. We've already talked about that. Patients were giving mercury and arsenic, all sorts of terrible poisons that were doing more harm than good. So as a reaction to that, he invented homeopathy. Two key principles of homeopathy. Like cures like. It, it, whatever harms you can potentially make you better. Or, or for example, actually, let me, let me look at it a different way. If you get hay fever and you get runny eyes... Well, what else gives you runny eyes? Well, onions do. Onions make your eyes water. So onions could become the basis of a homeopathic cure for hay fever. That's the basic principle. The second principle there is dilution increases potency. So if you dilute the onion juice over and over and over again and make it weaker, it actually has a stronger curative ability. So those are the two key principles. Like cures like... But the greater the dilution, the bigger the effect. Now, this sort of makes sense. Uh, I've said here it's a bit like vaccination. A little of what harms you, the virus or a fragment of the virus, can cure you. And, and you only want a little bit of it to be beneficial. So it sounds appealing at first sight, but when you look at it in more detail, it just, you realize how ridiculous it is. Um, this is, is, is from a Materia Medica, which is sort of a, 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 a guide that a homeopath would have in their office, which lists all the homeopathic remedies and all of the things that it can cure. So this is a page for acetic acid or vinegar, and that list is all the things that acetic acid can cure. Presumably because these are all the things that acetic acid can cause, because like cure, cures like. So acetic acid, vinegar, can cure and cause... Things like worries about business affairs, uh, pain across the root of the tongue, a putrid sore throat, scurvy down there we can see, um, even sausage poisoning. Um, all can be cured and caused, caused by vinegar, but cured by homeopathic vinegar. And when you look at a whole list like this, you realize this is a little bit ridiculous. But let's look at it in more detail. Let's look, let's look at the dilution process, which I would argue is even more ridiculous. Um, 
when we talk about dilution, we're talking about a level of dilution which is absolutely and utterly extraordinary. If I take a drop of vinegar, or let's say acetic acid here, a drop of acetic acid probably contains 10 to the 22 molecules. That means about 10,000 million, million, million molecules. So what you do is that you start off with your drop and you put it into 100 drops of water and uh, you, you shake it. Now I take one drop of that, which I've now diluted by a factor of 100, and I put that into another beaker of water and I shake that. So I've now diluted that by another factor of 100, uh, which we call 2C, C being the, the Roman numeral for 100. So I've now got 100 less times 100 less molecules. I've only got 10 to the 18 molecules in one drop of this water, which is still a huge amount. But if you repeat this process of dilution, you only need to do it about nine more times, and you end up with a drop of water that contains only one molecule of acetic acid. But you carry on diluting if you're a homeopath. Typically, you'll dilute another 18 times, um, which means you're diluting pure water. Your final, your final beaker has nothing in it, but you carry on diluting. And in fact, sometimes uh, homeopaths will dilute maybe 300 times. It's extraordinary, the level of dilution that can go on. And then you take a sugar pill and you dilute it. You, you put a little drop of, of water on the sugar pill, and that's your homeopathic remedy. It just sounds utterly ridiculous. Like cures like sounds ridiculous from what we've seen. The level of dilution sounds impossible because the final pill has got nothing in it. So it's an utterly ridiculous, bizarre, and absurd notion. But science actually kind of likes bizarre and absurd notions. In fact, the whole of science is built on these kind of notions. Um, and as a scientist, you have to be open-minded. So you can't just ignore this straight away and say, this is just ridiculous, we're not even going to look at it. Especially when you hear homeopaths and patients talking about it so positively, you have to be open-minded and you have to um, look at it in some detail. My favorite example of this, and I mentioned this the other night, was a physicist um, called Fritz Vicky. Uh, Fritz Vicky was an astronomer and uh, he came up with the idea of dark matter. Dark matter is the idea that the majority of our universe is made up of stuff that we can't see. And it's not like the matter that we're made of. It's preposterous. Most of the universe is made of stuff we can't see, and it's not like the stuff we have here on Earth. Zwicky predicted this 60 or 70 years ago, and everybody laughed at him. But while laughing at him, they also went out and did experiments. And it turned out that Zwicky was right. So that's what I mean about science being open-minded. Homeopathy sounds absurd, but you have to go away and test it. And that way you find out whether it really is absurd or whether there is something to it. My other favorite story about Zwicky is if he didn't like somebody, he had a very good insult. His insult for people he didn't like was to call them a spherical bastard. <laughs> By this he meant a sphere is a geometrical object which looks the same whichever way you look at it. And a spherical bastard is someone who's a bastard whichever way you look at them. Um, <laughs> But that's irrelevant to this story. This, that, that's irrelevant. That, that's, the, the relevant thing is that he came up with crazy ideas, but science was open-minded enough to look at them, and it turned out his crazy ideas weren't so crazy. So let's look at homeopathy. Um, well, there have been over 200 clinical trials for homeopathy. Some of the results are positive. Some of them are, some of them are negative. Um, and so there's just disagreement. And that, that's why I was saying one of Edzard's main roles has been to pull all of this data together in what are called a meta-analysis or a systematic review. That means you take lots of papers and try and make sense of them. Uh, so what do the, what do the meta-analyses tell us about homeopathy? And when you conduct one of these reviews or meta-analyses, what you're doing is you're saying, right, I've got an experiment here that was really badly conducted. There was no control group, so I'm going to throw that one away. I've got an experiment here. This was really badly conducted because patients weren't randomized. This group was full of, of, of men. This group was full of women. Therefore, it's a, maybe an unreliable test. Um, this experiment is really well conducted, but only had 10 people in it. So I'm not going to give that very much weight. This experiment was really well conducted with 1,000 people. So I'm going to put more weight on this one. So you begin to separate the wheat from the chaff and focus on the best research. 
because the best research gives you the most reliable results, and that will give you the most reliable conclusions. So what happens when we do this? Well, there's an organization called the Cochrane Review, and the Cochrane Review sets itself the job of conducting systematic reviews on everything. Uh, conventional medicine, uh, manipulative therapies, um, anything and everything, including alternative therapies. And these are five uh, reviews conducted on homeopathy for various conditions. And the results are not impressive. For asthma, Cochrane says there's not enough evidence. For, influ for, for influenza, it says uh, the data is not strong enough. For induction of labor, there's insufficient evidence. Uh, dementia, in view of the absence of evidence, it's not possible to comment. Attention deficit disorder, this review found no evidence. Now, you might say that's kind of equ equivocal. It's kind of saying, well, there's, there's not enough, we don't know. But after 200 years and after 200 clinical trials, the best we can say is there's no convincing evidence that this works for anything at all. Which, based on the biological plausibility of homeopathy, is not very surprising. When you look at homeopathy, it sounds so crazy you don't think it would work. And when you actually look at the hard data, again, it doesn't look like it would work. So um, one of the most famous meta-analyses was not published by Cochrane V, but it was published by Shang uh, uh, out of a Swiss group, I think. And uh, Shang published his article uh, review in The Lancet, one of the most prestigious scientific journals. And his view, again, looking at all of the data together, was that his finding is compatible with the notion that the clinical effects of homeopathy are placebo effects. And in that same journal, that same issue of The Lancet, the editor said, doctors need to be bold and honest with their patients about homeopathy's lack of benefit. So for us, for Ed's and myself, this is the state of play of homeopathy. Um, it just doesn't seem to work. Um, now, we've got no axe to grind. I, uh, I, I, don't, I would love homeopathy to work. If it worked, it would help patients. If it worked, we'd learn something new about physics or chemistry or biology or all three. But the sad truth is it doesn't seem to work. And so we feel it's our responsibility to put that clearly and boldly in the book and to let other people know about that. Because if you've got money to spend, if you're a government or if you're an individual, you need to spend money on stuff that does actually work rather than stuff that doesn't work. Um, Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.